In this video, we're going to learn how to implement a feedforward neural network in Keras to classify handwritten digits from the MNIST dataset. In this notebook, we'll introduce several new concepts in the context of image classification involving more than two classes. This is sometimes referred to as multinomial regression or softmax regression when the number of classes is more than two. Specifically, we'll see how to classify handwritten digits from the MNIST dataset using a feedforward multilayer perceptron network. MLPs are not the preferred way to process image data, but this serves as a good example to introduce several new concepts before moving on to covering more complex networks known as convolutional neural networks, or CNNs for short. So let's go ahead and dive in and get started. Since the MNIST dataset is included in Keras, we can use the load data function to load the dataset. The MNIST dataset contains 70,000 images partitioned into 60,000 samples for training and 10,000 for test. Reserving a portion of the data for validation can be accomplished by further partitioning the training data. As shown below, we carve out 10,000 samples from the training data to use for validation. And just to confirm, we can print the shape of each data set after this partitioning, which shows we have 50,000 training samples and 10,000 for both validation and test. In the next code cell below, we're plotting the first three images from the training set just to get an idea what they look like up close. And notice that they're all 28 by 28 pixels. Now that we've loaded and split our data set, we need to prepare it for processing through the network by making some transformations. Recall from our previous video on linear regression, we had just a single input feature. But since we're now working with images as the input, we'll need to find some logical way to represent the image data as a set of features. A naive approach that actually works fairly well for this data set is to just assume that the pixel intensities are the features. And one way to transform the image data into a set of features that we can process through the network is to flatten the 2D image data into a one-dimensional vector. We can accomplish this by reshaping the sample images in each of the data sets as shown below. Since we know the images are 28 by 28 pixels, we can use the NumPy reshape function to reshape the 2D data into a vector of length 784. Notice that we also normalize the pixel intensities to be in the range 0 to 1. This is very common when working with image data, which helps the model train more efficiently. Before getting into the details of the network architecture, we also need to talk about how to represent the image labels. Recall in our previous post on linear regression, the target values were floating point numbers. But when working with categorical data, as in the case of image classification, the target labels, which are typically strings, need to be transformed to numerical values prior to processing the data through the neural network. The process for converting class labels from strings to numerical values is referred to as label encoding, and we have a couple of options for how to do this. We can use ordinal integer encoding, where an integer is assigned to each class, or we can use a technique called one-hot encoding, which uses separate binary vectors to encode each class label. Depending on the data set, one approach might be preferred over the other, but for most situations, one-hot encoding is an appropriate choice. Since this is an introductory post, we'll briefly demonstrate what each encoding looks like so you're familiar with both representations. Data sets that contain categorical labels may represent the labels internally as strings or as integers. However, if the labels are strings, they must first be transformed to a numerical representation prior to processing the data set through the network. When the data set contains integer labels for categorical data, a class label file is also provided that defines the mapping from class names to their integer representations in the data set. This is usually just a simple text file that contains the mapping. As a concrete example, consider the dictionary mapping shown below for the Fashion MNIST dataset, which contains 10 classes of various clothing items. The Fashion MNIST dataset itself contains the integer labels, which we can verify by loading the dataset and printing out some of the labels as shown in the output from the code cell below. So you can see that the first sample in the dataset is represented as the integer 9, which corresponds to an ankle boot. This type of encoding is called integer encoding because unique integers are used to encode the class labels. 
However, when class labels have no relationship to one another, one hot encoding should be used instead, which amounts to an extra pre-processing step that we need to perform. So for example, if we have 10 classes in a data set, those labels are converted to 10 vectors, each with a length of 10. Since the labels from the MNIST handwritten digit data set have integer labels that correspond directly to the class labels, we don't really require a class mapping file. And further, since the integer labels have a natural ordering, we could use the integer encoding directly if we like. But since one-hot encoding is most often used, we'll transform the labels in the digit data set to one-hot encoded vectors as shown in the next code cell. Now that we've pre-processed the data sets, we're ready to talk about the network architecture that's shown in the diagram below. This may look rather complicated at first, but we're going to break this down so we can introduce some new concepts and get familiar with some of the internal components in the network. As shown below, the network has multiple layers, an input layer, two hidden layers, and an output layer. First notice that the input image is transformed from a two-dimensional array to a one-dimensional vector of length 784, where the elements in this input vector are the normalized pixel intensities. The input to the network is sometimes referred to as the input layer, but technically it's not a layer in the network because there's no trainable parameters associated with it. Next, we have two hidden layers that contain some number of neurons that we'll need to specify further below. Each of the neurons in these layers has a nonlinear activation function, for example, ReLU or sigmoid. After that, we have 10 neurons in the output layer to represent the 10 different classes 0 through 9. All the layers in the network are fully connected, meaning that each neuron in a given layer is fully connected to each of the neurons in the previous layer. The weights associated with each layer are represented in bold to indicate that these are matrices that contain each of the weights for all the connections between adjacent layers in the network. We're not showing each of the individual connections, but it should be understood that there's a connection between each neuron in one layer and each neuron in the subsequent layer. The values from each of the neurons in the output layer are passed through a softmax function to produce a probability score for each of the 10 digits in the data set. We're not going to cover the details of the softmax function here, but you can think of it as simply a way to normalize a set of inputs. So the raw scores from the output layer are passed through a softmax function to normalize them into probabilities. The network output, y prime, is a vector of length 10 that contains the probabilities of each output neuron. So predicting the class label for a particular input image requires passing the output, y prime, through the argmax function to determine the index of the predicted label. Finally, we have the loss function, and here we're specifying it as cross-entropy loss, which is generally the preferred loss function for classification problems. It's computed from the ground truth labels y and the output probabilities of the network y prime. Note that both y and y prime are vectors whose length is equal to the number of classes, which in this case is 10. Although this diagram looks quite a bit different from the single layer perceptron in the linear regression example, it's fundamentally very similar in terms of the processing that takes place, aside from the extra layers in this particular network. We still compute a loss based on the predicted output of the network and the ground truth labels. Backpropagation is used to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights in the network. And an optimizer, which implements gradient descent, is used to update the weights in the neural network. Now that we have a better understanding of the network architecture, we're going to implement the model in Keras in just a few lines of code. We start by instantiating a sequential model in Keras, and then we're going to use the add method to add two hidden layers followed by the output layer. Notice that when we define the first hidden layer, we also need to indicate what the input shape is for each data sample. Recall that the original shape for X train was 50,000 by 28 by 28, but after flattening the image data, the shape of X train is now 50,000 by 784. So here we're indicating that the shape of the input is a vector of length 784 elements. Both hidden layers have 128 neurons, which is a design choice. We could have made these smaller or larger, but this is something that you typically need to experiment with to determine what works best for your particular application. Notice also that we're using a ReLU activation function for both of these hidden layers, 
and you can try other functions as well, but Relu is considered a good choice for most situations. For the output layer, we specify a softmax activation function, but unlike in the previous layers where each neuron has its own activation function, in the output layer, the output of the neurons are passed through a single softmax function to convert the raw scores into probabilities. After defining each of these three layers in the network, we can print the model summary as shown below, which indicates the shapes of each of the layers and the total number of trainable parameters in each layer. So for this model, there's over 100,000 trainable parameters. And this might surprise you, but this is considered a very small network while most networks that process images contain many millions of parameters. Next, we need to compile the model, which is where we specify the type of optimizer to use, the loss function, and also where we can specify any additional metrics to track during the training process. Here, we're gonna use the RMS prop optimizer that's available in Keras. As mentioned above, the preferred loss function for classification problems is cross entropy but depending on how the labels are encoded, we'll need to specify the proper form of the cross-entropy loss function in Keras. If the labels are integer encoded, then you should use sparse categorical cross-entropy. However, if the labels are one-hot encoded, as they are here, then you should specify the loss function as categorical cross-entropy. We're not gonna cover the details of the cross-entropy loss function here, but the main thing to understand is that it's a simple computation that allows you to quantify the error between the output probabilities and the one-hot encoded vectors for each class. Finally, we also specify accuracy as an additional metric to record during training so that we can plot it after training is completed. The training loss and validation loss are automatically recorded, so there's no need to specify those explicitly. We're now ready to train the model, and to do so, we call the fit method in Keras. We need to specify the training data set along with the number of training epochs and the batch size. Recall from an earlier video in this series on linear regression that we can use the validation split argument to automatically withhold a percentage of the training data for use as the validation data set. However, since we made the decision to split the original training data into train and validation components, we need to explicitly specify the validation data set using validation data. So here we're demonstrating how to explicitly use a separate validation data set. Notice also that the fit method returns a history object that contains a record of all the training data that we can access and plot later. So let's now continue on and take a look at the results. So here we're gonna start by defining a convenience function that we'll use to plot the training and validation losses and training and validation accuracies. It has a single required argument, which is a list of metrics to plot. In the next code cell, we're gonna use predefined dictionary keys to access those metrics from the history object and then call the plot results function to create both sets of plots below. Let's first take a look at the loss curves where the training loss is shown in green and the validation loss is shown in blue. Both start to decline initially, but after the first five epochs, the validation loss starts to steadily increase while the training loss continues to decline and nearly reaches zero after 20 epochs. This kind of behavior indicates that the model is doing an excellent job on the training data set, but doesn't do as well when presented with images that it's never seen before in the validation data set. So it's apparent that the model is overfitting to the training data. This is a very common problem in machine learning and there are several techniques that we can use to mitigate this, which we'll cover in future videos. Next, let's have a look at the accuracy plots. First notice that the lower end of the scale starts at 90% accuracy and that the accuracy for both the training data set and the validation data set increase in the first few epochs and then after about five epochs, the validation accuracy reaches a steady state of about 98%, while the training accuracy reaches nearly 100%, which again is rather typical for a model that's overfitting on the training data. However, an accuracy of 98% is still rather impressive. That means that the model makes, on average, only one mistake in every 50 samples. The final section of this notebook covers the topic of model evaluation. Once we have a trained model, we can call the model's predict method to obtain predictions for any number of samples. 
So in the code cell below, we can pass the entire test set to the predict method, and notice that we only need to pass the images x test. This function returns for us 10,000 predictions for each of the 10,000 samples in the test data set. Each prediction contains the probabilities for each of the 10 neurons in the output layer. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, we're printing out the very first prediction, which is index 0, and looping over the 10 neurons for that prediction. The ground truth label for the first sample image is a 7, which you can see from the one-hot encoded vector. And notice that the probability for each of the neurons in the output layer is essentially 0, except for the 8th neuron, which represents the digit 7, which has a probability of 1. So the model is absolutely confident that the first sample image is a 7, which does correspond to the ground truth. However, a more informative way to evaluate the model on the entire test set is to produce what's called a confusion matrix, and that's the topic of the last section in this notebook. A confusion matrix is a very common metric that's used to summarize the results of a classification problem. The information presented is in the form of a table or a matrix where one axis represents the ground truth labels for each class, and the other axis represents the predictions from the model. The total number of entries in the table represent the number of instances from an experiment. Let's first briefly describe the code shown below. Here again, we call the predict method on the test data set and get 10,000 predictions. Since the predictions for each sample contain 10 probabilities, we need to pass those predictions through an argmax function to determine the index of the class label, which corresponds to the neuron with the highest probability. And this returns for us a list of the predicted labels for every sample in the test data set. But since our labels were one hot encoded, we need to further convert those to integers, which represent each of the 10 possible classes. Generating a confusion matrix can be done in one line of code calling the confusion matrix function in TensorFlow and passing it a list of ground truth labels and a corresponding list of the predicted labels. And then there's a few extra lines of code below that plot this information in the form of a heat map. The heat map simply adds helpful visual information for consuming the data, but it's the numbers that matter, so this information is sometimes provided as a simple table of numbers. And oftentimes, they may be reformatted as percentages rather than total counts. To get a better feel for how to interpret this information, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Let's first take a look at the second row of the matrix, which corresponds to the ground truth for the digit 1. So here we have 1,128 samples that were correctly classified as a 1, and only 7 samples that were misclassified as other digits. You can also gain some additional insight by taking a look at some of the worst case misclassified examples. For example, in the case when the ground truth label was a 4, it was most often misclassified as a 9 which is indicated by the 19 in the last column of the matrix. And this makes sense since the digit 4 has a similar structure to a 9. So one thing that should now be apparent is that while the model has an overall accuracy of 98% on the validation data set, you can see that by inspecting the confusion matrix, we can learn a little bit more about which classes might be more difficult to predict. In this video, we introduced a simple approach for how to model image data for use in a simple feedforward multi-layer perceptron network to perform image classification. In the next video, we're going to learn about a special type of network called a convolutional neural network, or CNN for short, that are specifically designed to process image data. The following link contains a really nice interactive web-based animation of several well-known CNN architectures which is a great place to start getting familiar with how they work. In closing, we wanted to mention something that you might be wondering about. Given the large number of parameters and neurons in neural networks, there really isn't a simple undertaking to understand how they actually work at a low level that you're going to be able to internalize for anything beyond a very simple example. They involve millions of simple mathematical operations which have the ability to model very complex nonlinear functions in dimensions that we can't possibly visualize. So rather than trying to make sense of those details, we encourage you to focus on the high-level components, that we define a loss function that quantifies the error between the ground truth and the expected result, and that there exists a methodical way via backpropagation followed by gradient descent to fine-tune the parameters of a network.
We haven't discussed how backpropagation works, but it's a well-established algorithm for computing the gradients of the loss function that's baked into all modern deep learning frameworks. And so while it can be helpful to study such material, it isn't required for using neural networks in practice. We hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.